Hello, I'm Pastor Bill Vigio of Meet of the Word Ministries, and you're watching Let Us Go On, an outreach television program to encourage you and inspire you to go on in the things of God, particularly sound doctrine, growing in the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this, I believe, is our eighth program that we're producing here through the network, and I have to tell you that each and every week we have had one buffeting blow after another. I have just had one difficulty. It seemed like a couple days before when I'd get over here, something would happen that would try to throw me off my message. One day I slipped and, and scraped my head real bad, and I mean it was a real ugly scrape, and my wife had to get out her, her, uh, her whatever it is, the makeup kit, and she fixed me up so I could look at least a little better. But uh, this weekend I had a real rough time. I had, uh, was up in Arlington, Virginia, and uh, I left late Saturday night to come, come on down here thinking maybe someone would need me on Sunday morning, but I had a uh, severe cold. I don't know exactly what happened, but by the time I had gotten home, I got in my chair in the living room and I slept there until 7.30 in the morning, and then it was Sunday morning, and at 7.30 I got into bed and I decided to keep the Sabbath. Now, I'm prone to breaking the Sabbath. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, you know, work six days and on the seventh day rest, and sometimes I've not been faithful to do that, but this time I made a decision that I was going to be faithful because I wanted to be ready for today's uh, uh, TV program. But while I was there, tossing and turning, going from one side to another, I was meditating on the things of God. God was really speaking to my heart. Four or five sermons came to me, and I was really preparing, you know, Lord, which one would you want me to share today? And the message that I believe the Lord wanted me to share is Paul's thorn in the flesh. And it's relative to what I was going through, because like I say, I was so sick. Now, when you talk about a person like myself who believes in faith and divine healing and divine health, and for a person like me to get sick, you, know, you say, well, what's the matter with you? You preach faith and healing and all this other stuff, and now you're sick, and I was sick for that 24-hour period. But uh, I've also found something else out when I deal with the subject of faith and healing, and that is that you're just not going to get healed by accident. It's just not going to fall upon you. It's not going to be just slapped upon your face. God's not just going to inundate you with it. You know, bottom line is you're going to have to understand to fight the good fight of faith. If you're going to receive any of the blessings of God, you're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. And so I decided to fight the good fight of faith on Sunday was to stay in bed. I refused to get out of bed. Went to my right, went to my left, curled up, and I was determined to get rid of this cold before I got in this... Uh, studio here today. But one of the things that was burdening on my heart was the subject of Paul's thorn in the flesh and how it is such a faith weakening subject to so many Christians today. Satan has abused that teaching and that message that the Apostle Paul had presented in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12. And so there are many people that are weak and sickly and they fall upon that very thing. They say, well, God has put me through this thing. He's given me a thorn in the flesh to keep me humble, to keep me from being prideful and conceited. And as a result, they stay sick. They're never able to rise up to the occasion of overcoming it. And actually, Paul's thorn in the flesh is an overcoming message. And I want to emphasize that here today. Now, there have been over the centuries of Christian history a bunch of opinions of what Paul's thorn in the flesh is. And let me read a few of them. Number one, some kind of nervous condition, including epilepsy, an unconverted wife, a speech impediment, agony over the Jewish rejection of the gospel, the Roman Catholic Church or writers think that it denoted that there was some kind of impiety in Paul's life. Some believe it was some kind of pain such as an ear or head infection. Others believe such as uh, Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin and other early reformers interpreted it, the expression as an, a, a temptation of disbelief that he was always struggling with. Is God real? Is God really real? Am I really serving the living God? Another one is in medieval time was it was suggested as a sexual temptation, uh, possibly even homosexuality. Then many suggest it was a chronic eye disease, which Paul used to keep 
or which God used to keep Paul humble, keep him from being conceited. And then some argue that it was, uh, and, and I agree with this one, some suggest and argue that it was opposition to Paul's ministry based on the meaning of Satan being uh, the adversary. Now, bottom line is, the Bible is not left to our private interpretation. Again, you'll hear me say this over and over and over again. We are to study to show ourselves approved. A workman, and that's work, studying the word of God is work. That's why a lot of people don't study because it's too much work for them. Study to show yourself approved. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if we would just let the Bible interpret itself, we would be much better off and far more accurate the Apostle Paul knew what he was talking about. And the Christians of that day, when he wrote to those Christians back in, second, in his second epistle to the Corinthian church, they knew what he meant as well. The Apostle Paul, now I want to read this. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse uh, 1. Paul defending his ministry and actually continuing to defend his ministry because he had already presented his, his case a little earlier, he says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ, speaking about his own personal experience, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one that was caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which was not lawful or possible for a man to utter. Now the Apostle Paul is talking about spiritual experiences that he was receiving with the Lord. If you remember, there was a time in his life where Paul, was his name was Saul of Tarsus, he was a great persecutor of the church, hated the Christian faith because he thought it was the enemy of the one true God. And then on the, on the Damascus Road, he was dramatically um, converted and had visions and revelations, and God began to take his ministry further and further and further. Step by step, he began to be first a witness, then a disciple of Christ, then he began to be a teacher in the church of Antioch, and then he also became a prophet, and Barnabas kind of took him under his wing, and they ministered together, and eventually the Holy Spirit separated the two as apostles and, and called them out to minister and go journeying and traveling in their ministry, and as a result, great signs, wonders, and miracles, great victories were taking place in the Apostle Paul's ministry, but what many people don't don't understand is the obstacles, the buffeting that he refers to. And those are the things that I want to try to explain to you. Because the Apostle Paul did not have some sickness or some disease. He might have had some difficulties from time to time. If you get beaten with rods and whipped and, you know, there's no doubt he's in pain and, and suffering and all those things were were hitting him and you know if he got slapped in the face or lashed in the eyes he might have had some difficulty seeing here and there and maybe that's one of the reasons why Luke the physician was there with him to help tend to some of those physical needs that were there but the apostle Paul was a supernaturally gifted man of God who's received from God visions and revelations so that he could fulfill the ministry that he had been called to and so we want to focus on that. I want, to, I want you to focus on the fact that you've been called. Every, when I talk about you, I am talking about every born-again Christian. Anyone that is born again has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, has repented of their sins and have turned their, uh, away from the wicked ways and have turned their face to God. They are Christians. They are now members of the body of Christ, and they now have an assignment part of the Great Commission. You've been called to do something. If you're sitting in a church today and you're doing nothing, you are missing the will of God. You are not pleasing God at all. He has something for you to do and you've got to get up and do it. But it's easy for some people, like the many people today in regards to Paul's thorn in the flesh, they'll use that as an excuse not to do anything. They'll look and say, well, you know, the obstacles are too severe. They're too hard. I've got to quit. I mean, I could have easily gotten here today or s s Sunday and just said, I'll never be ready for Tuesday. 
There's just no way I'm going to be able to preach and teach on Tuesday the presentation, my TV programming, uh, because I'm just too sick. I could have get, give up, gave up. And then also, I could have concluded instead, you know, God, maybe you don't want me to do this. Maybe you're trying to tell me something. Maybe you're trying to suggest that I shouldn't do this or I shouldn't do that. That is not being led by the Spirit. That's being led by the flesh or being persuaded by the devil. No, we need to understand the Apostle Paul, he overcame the obstacles one after another, but sometimes he didn't understand what was going on. Now, verse 7 says this. This is after Paul had said, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. And then he says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Let's stop and let's consider this for a moment. This was a messenger of Satan or an, an, a mess, uh, an angel of Satan. The Bible tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible tells us that we wrestle against them. We're not supposed to condone with them. We're not supposed to accept them. We're not supposed to tolerate them. We're supposed to wrestle against them. We are to put on the whole armor of God to do the will of God. And so the Apostle Paul tells us that he, lest he should be exalted above measure, now, the New International Bible translation, which to me is one of the modern worst translations that I've ever seen because it's made up basically of intellectuals of many denominations and some of them that don't even believe in the power of the Holy Spirit today. And they've translated this verse, and lest I should become conceited. But in this reference, the Apostle Paul has, there's no reference whatsoever of pride or conceit. Matter of fact, in one place where the Apostle Paul said regarding appointing leadership, he said not to appoint a novice lest he be lifted up in pride. Well, that word pride, the Apostle Paul knew very well, but he did not use that in this context, did not use the word that would be translated conceited. It says here, and lest I should be exalted above measure. This is actually a reference of unless the devil sees that these revelations that God has given to me, these visions and revelations, which he's given to me to exalt me, he said, lest I should become, you know, uh, uh, too much to handle, in other words, of the devil, there was sent to me a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me down. The word buffet here wasn't a reference to disease either. It is something that means a blow by blow, a wave after wave, just one little obstacle after another, one little difficulty after another. And so again, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Again, lest I should be exalted above measure. The Apostle Paul uses that term in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, where he wrote, wrote to the church there, and he said, And I know that you have heard how that uh, I was above or beyond measure I persecuted the church. So he had nothing to do with conceit, but he above measure persecuted the early church. He vehemently tried to stop the church. And this is exactly, the devil was working through him. He was one of, one of those thorns in the flesh at that time, a messenger of the devil. And now it was happening to him. Now this is early on in his ministry when he's writing this. And it goes on to say, and I, I want to, I wanna, um, again, let the Bible interpret itself. It says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. First thing we need to understand is, as the light of God comes to each of us as individuals, we are directed and commanded to walk in that light. Paul had visions and revelations which enabled him. The Bible tells us, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due season. Both James and Peter said that. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. The Apostle Paul was probably the most humble human being outside of the Lord Jesus Christ that has ever existed in time. He humbled himself and humbled himself and humbled himself. He remained teachable. He remained uh, 
submissive to his brothers and sisters, but also humbled himself to speak boldly and to rebuke people when necessary and yield to the power of the Holy Spirit. It was God exalting the Apostle Paul, lifting him up. How is God going to promote anybody if, you know, if he doesn't give them revelation, if they don't know anything, if they stay in, you know, in an area where they just, you know, they're preaching a bunch of opinion and a bunch of nonsense? You know, how is God going to exalt us? The Apostle Paul says, lest I should be exalted above measure, above demonic opposition. Now, even Jesus did not obtain to that. If you remember with Jesus, when, when he was ready to go into his full-time ministry, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. And then at the end of those 40 days and 40 nights, we're told that the devil left him for a season. The devil never has stopped attacking Jesus when he was on the earth. And he's not, he's not, hasn't stopped attacking Jesus' body while it's on the earth. He, the devil, and I don't know if we want to call him a he, but he is doing all that he can to, to suppress the work of God. To keep us from being who we should be in Christ Jesus. He'll do anything he can from telling us that the days of miracles are over from telling us that uh, uh, we now have a perfect translation of the Bible and therefore we don't know, need the gifts of the Holy Spirit and we don't need any of these things whatsoever. Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. If Paul was tempted to exalt himself, to be lifted up in pride, then in, in reality God would have had to have been the tempter because he was the one that was given Paul the revelation. Now, the third thing, and this is very important, the Apostle Paul, when he uses the phrase uh, thorn in the flesh, this was a metaphor from the Bible, from the Old Testament. Three times, in fact, it is used. In Numbers chapter uh, 33, in Joshua, uh, I think it's Joshua, uh, Joshua chapter 23, and in Judges chapter 2. Three times in the, in the law of Moses, we have a case where that metaphor was there. In other words, all the children of Israel, all the new converts of that first generation understood what Paul was talking about when he referred to a thorn in the flesh. And uh, I want to read, I want to read uh, Numbers chapter 33, verse 55. Moses had spoken to the children of Israel. He had told them in chapter 28 to hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all that he command, commanded you. And, uh, and if you did that and you obeyed God, that all these blessings would come upon you. But if you did not, then all these curses would come upon you. And then he continued to explain certain things to them. And then he spoke to them, Moses now to the children of Israel, saying that God is going to bring you into that promised land. And when you get into that land, you're going to have to do battle. You're going to have to defeat your enemies. I will give you the land. I will help you. I will work with you confirming the word that I'm promising you with signs following. You will have massive victories. You will, you will have military success. You will have moral success. I will be with you, but you're still going to have to fight. The Bible again tells us, fight the good fight of faith. The Bible tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Peter, or I think it was Peter, he said, and listen, understand that Satan roams about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist, therefore, steadfast in the faith. We as Christians have to understand that we have a covenant with God, whether it's under the old covenant where Israel was functioning or whether it's today the new covenant that the, 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 new, uh, the new Testament is functioning in our lives, we still have a part responsibility in, a, you know, in acquiring the covenant promises and blessings. Again, God has done everything for us, but we've got to receive it. We've got to take it. We've got to take it by faith, or we've got to take it by love. Love, I mentioned last week, love hopes all things. It doesn't hope just a little bit. It hopes all things. It never lacks hope. It not only hopes all things, it believes all things. It has faith in everything that God said. That's why love is the greatest. 
And so God was telling them in Numbers chapter 33 that I'm giving you the land, but you're going to have to possess it. And you are going to, you have the responsibility to drive out every one of those inhabitants. And then he said this as a consequence in chapter uh, 33, verse 55, he said, but if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain, they shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. Today we have an awful lot of emphasis on immigration and you know being kind to the stranger and we're supposed to be kind to the strangers as God had said to Moses and told the children of Israel, you once were strangers in Egypt. But if you carefully read that, he told them still, you be kind to the stranger. You let them come in and be a part of, you know, affiliate with you, but don't learn their ways. Don't go and follow after their pagan rituals. Don't love their, their gods. Don't go after their gods. He warns them not. And here, this, this warning was, if you do not drive them out, if you do not take your responsibility. And see, I'm pointing this out because... I knew I had to do something. This past weekend, it knocked out. I mean, really, I was just out of it. But I knew the only thing I could do was keep the Sabbath. It was Sunday, and I just decided I'm going to stay in bed, and I'm not going to get out of bed. My wife came up around 3.30 in the afternoon. She goes, Bill, you still going to be in bed? And yeah, I was tempted to get up. I, there's so many things I could do. You know, I needed to make CD tapes. I needed to contact my mailing list. I needed to uh, do all kinds of editing and so many other things, just ministry alone. And yet, and I could have gotten up and do, done those things, but I just said, no, I'm going to keep this Sabbath. This time I'm going to take a day of rest, and all I'm going to do is meditate on the things of God. By faith, I will be all right for this next TV program that I've got to, you know, step into. I had to fight the good fight of faith. I had to find the wisdom of God to do something to make a change. This was a metaphor by the Apostle Paul, and God was speaking to him. Now, listen to what the Lord had said to him. It says, the Apostle Paul said, And for this thing, talking about this thorn in the flesh, for this thing I sought the Lord three times, that it might depart from me. And then after the third time, the Lord answered, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul goes on to say, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities or my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul was not saying he was going to remain weak. He was saying, I'm going to become strong. My grace is sufficient. The Lord spoke to him. Now, last week I opened the program by saying, uh, quoting from Peter that said, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God. The Apostle Paul at this time was going through a learning curve. And he did not quite understand the grace of God. He wanted God to take care of the devil for him. He wanted God to remove the devil. And after three times of asking, finally the Lord told him, he didn't say, no, I'm not going to do anything for you. Rather, he told him the answer. He gave him the wisdom. My grace is sufficient. My grace is enough. Use my grace. Now, he goes on to talk about all these difficulties that he had gone through. And here, here's one reference that I think is very important. Chapter 11, if you read that carefully, Paul is talking in defense of the false prophets and other people that were standing up, giving him a hard time. And he says, are they ministers? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes or beatings, above measure or excessively. In prisons, more frequent. In death situations. Off of the, of the Jews, five times received I 40 strife, save one. In other words, 39 lashes. He said, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep, 
in journeyings often in perils of water and robbers and perils of my own countrymen in perils by the heathen in perils in the city in perils in the wilderness in peril in the sea in perils among false brethren in weariness and painfulness and watchings often in hunger and thirst and fastings often and cold and nakedness besides all these these all these things the care of the church is upon me and then he goes on to say I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Paul learned to close this, and I want, I want to point this out as far as sufficient grace goes. Sufficient grace is more than sustaining grace, more than the ability to endure the trial and the test, but to overcome. Acts chapter 14, verse 3 says this, Long time therefore abode Paul and Barnabas, this was on their first missionary journey, uh, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony un unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The Apostle Paul was just beginning to learn about how powerful grace is. And grace has supernatural abilities that follow it. Paul closed the letter of 1 Corinthians, uh, 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 1 Corinthians in chapter 15 by saying this, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than all the others. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was within me. The grace of God working in you will cause you to labor. The grace of God will cause you to overcome. The grace of God will cause you to flow in signs, wonders, and miracles of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the grace of God is sufficient. We are to use the grace of God. We are to allow the grace of God to be multiplied in our life through the knowledge of God. Through the knowledge of God. And I want to encourage you today, if you've been struggling with something like I've been struggling, seems like a buffeting blow after blow after blow after blow, trying to hinder you, don't misinterpret those blows and say, gee, God is trying to tell me something. He doesn't want to work through me. He doesn't want to use me. But rather recognize this is the devil trying to tell you, don't work for God. Don't serve God. Don't step into your place. Uh, in, into your place. Don't step up to the bat. No, back off, back off. He will try to scare you. Don't let him scare you off. You stand your ground. Stand against the wiles of the devil. God bless you.